Thank you so much for joining us for uh, our last Faraday show of the year. Um, we really appreciate your time. We really appreciate the fact that you're here on time. Did you enjoy all the demos out there? Oh, yeah. 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 Now, my name is Dave Maiulo. If you don't know that, I built and design and basically produce all these physics demonstrations that you see here that we're going to use in the show. Um, basically, also in charge of all the things you just saw in, out in that room. Uh, we like to show people physics with those demonstrations in the classes, of course. But then we decided, hey, why not actually do a nice big public show, show people the physics who want to come in here and see it. And it's a very su successful show. At the same time, I'm really glad we all fit in this room today. I'm really glad, because that doesn't always happen, so that's fun. Now, did you interact at all with all those, all those young people out there? Aren't they wonderful? Yeah. Come on in, crew. Come on. Get them all in. Yeah, really. Come on in. Big smiles. That's right. Your turn to shine. These are my students. They give me reason and a lot of, for a lot of hope for the future, right? Because really, you see this kind of energy, excitement about physics, and you know we might actually survive some of the things we're doing to ourselves right now. Hopefully, right? <laughs> That's right. So, uh, and if you're coming to Rutgers sometime soon, and you want to do the same kind of thing that you see us do right here, you come and see me when you get to Rutgers, because I'll put you to work, right? And then you can be the one standing near the demo explaining the physics to someone as they come in, OK? So remember that if you do go to Rutgers, all right? OK, crew, go away now. So I'm Dave, but that's Mark, and I'm going to let him take it right now. Hi, I'm uh, Mark Groft. I'm a professor here. That's really only important because when we have bad things that may happen to the demonstrator, they like it to be a professor. <laughs> we have 40 professors, but we've only got one day. <laughs> and so the students enjoy it that way, too. Uh, it's a real joy to have you uh, come and, enjoy and uh, see the stuff that we love, physics and science. And uh, we have it organized a little bit like a physics course. And the, we're going to illustrate the physics with demos. And uh, the demos are meant to instruct, but also to have some fun and enjoy the holidays. Now, the, we found that our students enjoy the ones that embarrass the professor, um, humiliate the professor, endanger the professor. And then really the kicker is if it hospitalizes the professor. <laughs> That hasn't happened yet. There was at least one close call. One though. close call, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll mention later. OK, so we'll start off with the laws of physics. And the uh, first, Newton's first law is that objects at rest tend to stay at rest. And objects in motion tend to stay in motion. I'll move that later. <laughs> and uh, here I have some object at rest. And they're going to stay at rest, like me on the couch at home, as my wife says. <laughs> and this is, of course, my wife's best dinnerware. And so if I pull this fast enough, the law of inertia will leave these guys behind, and I won't have to buy new glasses. <laughs> This is, of course, a great demonstration to do at home at Christmas dinner, right? No, you don't do that. <laughs> uh, it, it has to be special circumstances. Now, in Newton's law of inertia, its objects at rest tend to stay at rest, but there is also law objects in motion tend to stay in motion. And poor old Aristotle, when he was doing physics, uh, he didn't have an air puck, so he found that he had to keep pushing on an object to keep it moving, much like my wife has to do with me. Uh, this, on the other hand, I can turn on a, a fan, and it floats, and now it will move at constant speed in one direction, in a straight line, until acted upon by some other force, like Dave and I are exerting. So its objects in, at rest tend to stay at rest, and objects in motion tend to stay in motion. So that's the first of Newton's laws. The next of Newton's laws is uh, the F equals MA, force equals mass times acceleration. Or if I push on something with a given force, 
how much it changes speed and accelerates will depend on entirely on how massive it is. And you know what is massive. Here's a sponge. It's not very heavy and it accelerates very easily. Here's a piece of wood. It doesn't accelerate nearly as much. Here I have a lead brick and I can feed on that and it hardly moves at all. As a matter of fact, the inertia is such that it won't accelerate much into my hand and I can beat on my hand all I want and it doesn't hurt at all. <laughs> okay, since we mentioned Aristotle, his teacher Plato also discovered that there were five regular solids, which are shown here, and I mostly show these because these mag formers are great for very young children to see the effect objects can attract each other by uh, magnetic force. But also they can construct a dodecahedron rather quickly. Right. So those are a lot of fun. Now, here I have some other magnets and Newton knew about magnetism already. Lodestone had been long known. And the thing it teaches you here is that action can occur at, the distant, at a distance. You don't have to push on it directly. Things can feel each other a ways away. So the concept of action at a distance is one of the most important things that magnetism tossed Newton. And these magnets are really quite safe. I don't have my Canadian nickel on here. It's also magnetic. <laughs> okay, so those are Newton's laws to begin with. Well, we're going to still cover a little bit of Newton's law. So force is equal to mass times acceleration. Oh my goodness, a physics equation. That means it's got to be really scary, right? No. Those physics equations just kind of model exactly what we see all the time. They're just basically telling us what we should expect. So let's think of it that way. What do I have? Whoops, whoops, whoops. Let's not do that. What do I have? Right here. A bowling ball. Are bowling balls big and massive? Yeah. yeah, they are. Bowling balls are nice and heavy, right? So we got this big heavy bowling ball right here. What's that bowling ball attached to? Is it a big heavy rope? No, no this is just a light little string, right? And if there's anything you get out of our show at all, it's that human beings really are scientists all the time. We really are. We basically look and see what's happening, and then we tell ourselves, well, that's how things really work. But as scientists, can you tell me, can I pick this heavy bowling ball up with this light little string? What do we do to find out? You do it. Try it. That's how you really learn in life, by doing the experiment. That's how you really learn, right? That experience is what actually you get from this. So if I move slowly, I can move that bowling ball right off the table surface just like that. Now, Am I moving a bowling ball fast? No. no. And uh, actually, and I don't want you to do it now because you should be paying attention to us and not your phones. But after the show, you say, hey Siri, what's a jerk? Really? Because a jerk, no, true. A jerk is a physics term. It means a change in acceleration. And if I'm here and I'm the jerk, I'm going to pull really hard on the string. What happens to the string? And you kind of know this because you've done similar things all your lives. You're applying that experience to this right here. But think about it this way too. Force is equal to mass times acceleration. The higher the acceleration, the more force on a string till it can't take it anymore. Three, two, one, and it breaks every time. But my next question. Yeah, thank you. When do you do this experiment? Never. Never? <laughs> Never. Well, I hope not. <laughs> Because let me introduce you to toilet paper. <laughs> yeah. If you want some squares, how do you pull it? Slow. You get enough squares, what do you do? You jerk it. It's the exact same experience. Do I really have to explain this one? Oh, I'm a little worried about the audience. OK. Hey. Do you know we have, yeah, thank you. We have another way of showing you force is equal to mass times acceleration. Or what we're going to do, we're actually going to use the atmosphere. And I go up to you, my friend, and I say, how heavy is the atmosphere on your body all the time? And you say? One bar. 
What? Yeah, well, you know the number, right? You might know the terms, but do you really understand how much force is on your body all the time from the atmosphere? And you probably really don't. Why? Because you're always in the atmospheric pressure. So there's really no reason for you to experience or understand just how much force that gives you. So we're going to look at it right here with this object right here. What we're going to do is take all the air out. No, no, not from the room. Just from this long tube right here. I'm going to turn on the vacuum pump. It's going to pull all the air out of this really long tube. Now, let's explain the experiment. Because what I have right here on one side of this really long tube is a ping pong ball. It's right inside this tube right here. What I have right here on the other side are three what? Soda cans, right? Right here. Soda cans are made of what? Metal, right? We kind of know that. Uh, ping pong ball is made of what? Plastic, but it's very, very, very low mass, right? That's metal, very low mass right here. But now that we've pulled all the air out of this really long tube, here's what we're going to do. I'm actually going to take a razor blade and I'm going to puncture the side of the tube right here. When I do that, the same force of air that's on your bodies all the time is then going to re-enter the tube on that side. Force is equal to mass times acceleration. The mass of the ping pong ball gets accelerated down the tube. When it leaves the side of the tube, it will be going 700 miles an hour. Yeah, that's pretty fast, right, for a ping pong ball? Two things about this. I dare anybody to see the ping pong ball move through the tube. It happens that fast. Also, this is an extremely loud noise. So if you're scared of loud noises, please cover your ears, OK? Three, two, one. Let's see what we've done. Oh, we only got through to one today. OK, you never quite know. That's why you do the experiment. This right here is what? A soda can get giving birth to a ping pong ball. <laughs> yeah. And it actually dented the second one. It got through all that way, but it didn't actually go through this all the way this time. Like I say, you never quite know, but that's what we have with atmospheric pressure and force is equal to mass times acceleration, all right? So there you go. Now, there's a third law of motion, and that third law of motion is this. For every action, there's an equal, I'll die. Every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, OK? So I can actually do this. I can take my two hands. I can press them together really hard like this. Lots of force both ways. But you don't see any motion there, right? There's just a lot of force. And right here, we have this really, really pretty red cart. And I can take this red cart. I can bring it out here. And here's what I can do to the red cart. I can push really hard on the surface. Really, really hard, but it just pushes equally back on me. A lot of force down, a lot of force up, but there's no motion there, right? We don't see anything moving. At the same time, this law and rule does give us motion. What exactly is that right there? A balloon. A balloon, right. What is it now? A bigger balloon. A balloon filled with what? Air. Air. And as we just saw, air is actually extremely massive. But if I let the balloon go, what does it do? goes in one direction. What does the air do? It goes the other way, which is why you get motion with this law. Three, two, one, and off it goes. But that's not so impressive. Let's try the exact same experiment with this. What's this? Helium. Not helium. CO2. No, CO2, OK, inside this fire extinguisher. It's a fire extinguisher filled with lots and lots of CO2 under extremely high pressure. It has a lot of force inside. And here's what I can do to all that force inside that fire extinguisher. I can go ahead and hit that sail right there with all that force. So when I do this, as scientists, I want you to tell me, what direction does my cart then go in? That way. That way. Look. There's no grading here today, OK? It's not even pass fail. You can say anything you want. No one is going to judge you, OK? So let's do a physics survey. Who says I go that way? Be brave. Be brave. Who says I go that way? Fantastic. Who thinks I'm headed this way? Thanks a lot. Who thinks I'm headed this way? Don't you raise your hand. Hey, two things about this. This is actually an extremely loud noise. So if you're scared of loud noises, please cover your ears. Two, it's just like a grenade. You actually pull the pin. There's that much force here, all right? So let's see what direction I go in. Three, two, one. Which way did I go? 
Nowhere. Nowhere. The only thing that happens is your butt gets really cold. That's it. It goes right down your pants. Now, why? You saw and heard how much force I applied to the sail, but there's no motion. But of course there wasn't. You don't push on yourself and go into motion. In fact, who in your rides a skateboard? Right? You want that skateboard to move, you push on the ground. Push on someone standing next to you, you don't push on yourself. Um, hey, do rockets have sails? No, rockets don't have sails. So here's what we're going to do. We got an astronaut right here. He's even got his helmet on. And Mark is now going to get on that cart, and he's now going to rocket across that room. But how is he going to be able to do that? Well, I'm actually going to take the sail off the cart. And when I take the sail off the cart, do we know what direction Mark's about to go in? That way. But let me ask you this. Before he does it, do I need to be behind him with the sail for him to go forward? No. no. There's nobody in outer space standing behind rockets, right? That's a lousy job to have. The job they gave me right here, all right? Let's see some rocket motion in action. Three, two, one. There you go. <laughs> actually, actually, this is my old college football helmet. And you'll notice it has a crack in it. Some people say that explains a lot of my behavior since then. <laughs> At any rate, I, it also fits a lot tighter. I think I must have a much fatter head. <laughs> uh, but Dave has been telling me that for years. That's true. <laughs> OK. Now, the way I used to do that is illustrated here. My first, I think this is the first version of this, this we ever had. Uh, this isn't the first time. Uh, here I am, and I'm holding a 50-pound fire extinguisher. I shoot it between my legs, and why don't we let it go? And I'm on roller skates. <laughs> the corners are the tough part. <laughs> Stopping is also difficult if you want to do it controllably. Uh, actually, the first time I discovered that if I didn't hold it in that strange way, I held it off to the side here, I discovered something else. <laughs> it sets me into rotation. Now, the first time I ever did this demonstration, may have been the first time this demonstration was ever done at anywhere, actually. Maybe. At Rutgers, maybe, maybe any, probably any place. I yeah. don't think there was anybody as crazy as me. Uh, I had a little fire extinguisher. And uh, I had an old pair of roller skates. And I was on a rug four in another building. And I did it, and nothing happened. And I got so angry, the next time I came back, I had a new pair of racing skates. <laughs> I had a 50-pound fire extinguisher. And uh, if you plot common sense on the vertical <laughs> scale and time on this scale, usually, you know, it goes up and things get better. But mine went to dead zero because I wanted to get off the rug floor. So I got up on a table about that tall. <laughs> And as I shot it, I discovered that if I didn't hold it right, I went into rotation. So I not only blew myself in translation, I was <laughs> rotating as I came off. <laughs> I never learned so much physics in such a short time in my life. <laughs> OK. All right, so now we're going to do circular motion. And lots of things move in basically circles, planets satellites, lots of things, merry-go-rounds. I like, a, I like this, a rope and a ball because I can't push with the rope. I can't go like this with the rope. The only thing I can do is pull towards my hand. So by holding it by a rope, I'm always pulling towards the center. So I can start it going in a circle. And the basic force is always towards the center of the circle for circular motion. And if I let go of it, at some point it goes off with the law of inertia in a straight line at constant speed. Watch out over there. I'm not so good as David was. <laughs> there we go. 
Now, the force is equal to mass times acceleration. And now we'll fill this glass with some champagne. And don't tell Rutgers they don't like us to have alcohol on campus, but don't let them know. And uh, now I have a very flat tray right here. I'm going to put that glass of champagne right in the middle of the flat tray. And now Mark is going to try to do the same thing with this that he just did there. All right? You know why they'd like to have me do this demonstration? Because I'm not very good at it. <laughs> so sitting in the front row is a little worrisome. <laughs> if I get it to stop in, control, in controllable fashion, I get a drink. I used to really need a drink after the fire extinguisher and the roller skates. Okay. There's only one problem. I don't know how to stop. Oh, that's the best one yet. <laughs> Wait a second, there's still enough in there for a little drink. Oh, that's the first time I got myself that bad, but well, that's all right. As I say, embarrass or humiliate the professor is uh, very much part of the show. Okay, so what are we up pendulum. to? And uh, oh yes. Okay, so the pendulum in the spring. Yeah. Uh, now we're going to talk about a little bit about energy. Actually, before the pendulum, right? I do this. Uh, we're going to talk about energy. We've talked about forces and accelerations and things like that and Newton's laws, but now we're going to talk about just energy. If I was to throw this at somebody really hard, it would be moving with a high speed and it would have energy of motion, which could be turned into energy of broken noses and things like this and all, all sorts of things. Uh, so that's energy of motion. But there's also a second kind of energy because I can get some energy of motion just by turning it over and letting gravity pull it down and it hits the floor with a certain speed and has energy of motion when it hits. So it must have had some energy of position here. And if I hold it much higher up and let go of it, the speed it gains is bigger so it has more energy of position or potential energy up here and when it hits the floor it then has more energy of motion. So you can convert energy of motion to energy of position and you can also do that with a pendulum. And here's my old friend the pumpkin and so I put him over here at a certain distance and he has energy of position. I let go of him when he gets to the bottom he has his energy of motion. When he gets back up to the same height he has energy of position. So they convert back and forth. And while we're on it, I want to emphasize that there's another way. You can do this with a pendulum. Here's the pendulum, and the longer the pendulum, the slower the swing. The smaller the length of the pendulum, the faster the swing. So you convert the, from energy of motion to energy of position at a time scale that varies on how long the pendulum is. And here's a spring. If I put a big mass on a spring, a little mass on the spring, this one goes bump, bump, and this one goes bump, 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 bump. And so it does it with a certain time. So it's not surprising that they built a pendulum clock because it measured out time with the conversion between the two. And it's not surprising they built clock, uh, clocks, wristwatches, and other clocks with springs. It has equal time for conversion between the two. I'll, I'll pick this one up later. Okay. Okay. So now, no. usually no. by this time my students are bored again, and it's been a while since I did something bad to myself. And so, Steve. First of all, I climb a large ladder, and I do have one artificial knee, and the other one is just as bad. And uh, you want your helmet? No, that's all right. <laughs> that wouldn't help that much. Uh, all right. So there's a cinder block, and I have lots of energy of position up here. 
This is a big steel wrecking ball. I let go of it and the energy of position goes into energy of motion and then the energy of destruction. So there's really quite a bit of energy in that. So now what I do is I put my money where my mouth is, or something like that, and I hold it up here to my nose, and I let go of it. And of course it will go to the bottom, energy of motion, it'll go to the other side, energy of position, but then it comes back here. Okay? But because of conservation of energy, it should be not traveling with it. I didn't move forward, did yeah, I? Just a little bit. Oh, I, I, I believe in my energy. <laughs> <laughs> you have to believe, but I can believe better with my eyes closed. <laughs> okay. I. <laughs> no, nothing really happened. <laughs> Oh, I've always, I've always imagined, we, we used to have a much bigger one. <laughs> and I've always imagined the worst case scenario, where as I let go of it, it slides over, misses me, but then I fall off the ladder as I'm getting up, it catches me on the next, next swing. <laughs> Uh, so much for physics nightmares. Well, do that demo next year. Yeah, I don't, I don't think so. Uh, yes. Now, I talked about things vibrating naturally. How you started them really doesn't matter. If I take this mass on a spring, and if I just compress the spring and let go of it, it vibrates with a certain natural repeating time. One, two, three. On the other hand, if I just go like this, one, two, three, the same motion. Doesn't matter what sets it off. But now suppose I actually put some energy in over a certain period of time. Suppose I do this. I wiggle it very slowly. The length of the spring doesn't change very much, does it? Suppose I wiggle it really fast. What length of the spring doesn't change very much, does it? But if I pull on it at just the right frequency, the time scale that it likes to vibrate on its own, then it builds up and up and up. One, 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 one. I think that's enough. <laughs> You see? So if I drive it at its natural frequency, which is its resonance frequency, it has its amplitude build up. Now this one isn't going to be driving it at a frequency. This is a singing rod, the only musical instrument I can play. And uh, it's just a plain old rod, and I have some rosin on my fingers. So I'm going to tickle it, and it will ring at its natural frequency it likes to vibrate at. <laughs> Holding it at the center doesn't, it can keep going. Grabbing it at the end kills it. That's because it's that top one up there. It's this one right here. Well, I guess a pencil doesn't point very well, does it? <laughs> uh, it's this top of my finger is here, and the end is vibrating, and it's free to vibrate, but when I transfer my hold to the end, it kills it. Okay? So now I'm going to move my fingers here closer to the end, and the vibration... Yeah, got it. This is one quarter of the way from the end of the whole one quarter of the whole length, and I'm going to tickle it again. So this will be a shorter, what we call wavelength later, and it'll be a higher frequency. We'll talk about this more later. So I'm going to tickle it. Doesn't bother it, kills it. Okay? That's because I tickled it and it excited this second standing resonance. Zero's here, so I transferred my fingers to here and it doesn't hurt it, 
but when I grab it at the center, it can't vibrate anymore at the center where I grab it, and so I kill it off. Want to give okay. you another good sound? Oh, yes, of course. From the center. And we're from the center, okay. What's that in my hand? <laughs> Styrofoam cup, right? That's all it is. Yeah. Mark's going to vibrate that rod again. Come on, Mark. You got this. Now I'm going to take it and I'm going to put it right at the end. Because it's also a loudspeaker. That's why speakers are shaped in this fashion. It's just an efficient way of getting sound energy into the air, right? Now, hey, it's the holidays, right? That means you guys all might be going out to dinner someplace special sometime, right? <laughs> and kids, when you sit down at that table, these glasses might be on the table in front of you. But guess what? You're too young to drink any wine. So sooner or later, the waiter's going to come wandering over and take that glass right from the table, right? Don't let this happen. <laughs> if I take this wine glass, and then what you're going to do, you're going to sit down, you take your hand, you put it right at the bottom of that wine glass just like that. Hold it nice and tight. Take your other fingers, put it right in your dad's water glass just like that. <laughs> and then go ahead and just rub the top of the glass. And when you do all that just right, you get a nice pretty tone from the wine glass. But what's the best part of this experiment? You're going to be bugging your parents. <laughs> all right? They'll be like, knock it off. You're bothering everybody. So what you say is, hey, I'm doing physics. This is going to go on all night long. All right? And who else is going to hear that sound, right? Who else is going to hear that sound is the waiter, right? And the waiter's like, oh my goodness, you can't. What's that noise in my restaurant? You know, you, you, know, you can't do that here. This is a quiet restaurant. You say, waiter, I got a question for you. If I go ahead and take the rest of my dad's water and fill the wine glass, do we have a higher tone or a lower tone? You sound just like the waiter. <laughs> higher or lower? What do we do to find out? Test it. Test it. It's now a lower tone. Because you know how the density of the water mixing with the density of the wine glass to give you a lower resonant frequency. And uh, you can now see the sound waves dancing in the top of the water, which is a lot of fun. But your parents are still getting bugged. So have fun with this experiment, all right, in your next restaurant. Now, we look down inside our box over here, and we see a beaker. And I could tickle that beaker with some sound. I could actually play some sound into the beaker and make that beaker ring. But you don't see anything happening up there. And you really shouldn't just believe what I tell you. You should actually look for some evidence. That's what we really need in life anymore, is a little bit of evidence. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to turn down all these lights right here. And I'm going to turn this light out, but I'm going to put that light on. And now I'm going to tickle it again. Because when I do all those things, do you see that beaker now? That beaker is actually shaking quite violently. I'm right at the resonant frequency of that beaker. Is it moving pretty good? Yeah. What happens if I give that beaker too much sound energy? Yeah. Would you like to see that? Yeah. Of course you would. You're all good physicists. Three, two, one. Breaks every time, just like that. Sound energy is actually very, very strong. That out. Take that out. There you go. You ready, Mark? Yep. There you go. <laughs> All right, you want to get over there? What market I now have is a very big rope slinky. Now, a rope slinky is just a very long spring, and uh, when we both pull on it, we actually have some tension between us, right? And there's always a little tension between me and Mark anyway. <laughs> but right now, we have this spring between us, right? Both pulling on it, and it's in a nice straight line. But I can do this. I can take my hand. I can give the spring some energy. I can give it a karate chop. And you're going to see that when I do that, it takes that energy and it moves back and forth across that spring, just like that. You can actually see the speed of that energy as it moves it back and forth across that big spring. So you now know that that energy travels there and comes back to me like this. So that's an energy pulse, right? But uh, we're going to do the same thing with one of the most expensive demonstrations we have here at Rutgers. What is this right here? It's a garbage can. Yeah, we've got a lot of budget cuts at Rutgers. So this is a trash can, a big metal trash can. What's it have on one side? A hole. And on the other side, I just have a big slab of rubber right here. 
And here's what I can do with my big trash can. I can go ahead and do this. I can hit the end. And some of you here may actually feel something. All right? Like that. <laughs> like that. And I'm not calling any one of you liars. You're not liars. That's not what this is about. Hey, you there in back. Did you feel anything? Yeah. No, you didn't. <laughs> and if they turned around and they said, look, I felt something, you really just have to believe me. Do you necessarily have to believe what they said? No. Right? You want evidence in, in life, right? Do you believe what you see on Twitter anymore? No. Do you, do you oh, believe what people put on Facebook? No. no, don't believe that stuff, right? It's a bad idea. So, in life and in science, we actually want to see proof of things. So what I have is this trash can over here. Put my buddy over here. He's going to let you bring that out front. Right here, that's it. Hold it up nice and high that way so they can all see it. And here's what I can do to that candle. I can go ahead and blow the candle out. Yeah. So you now know, no it wasn't. Now you now know that there's something going on with this trash can. But you still didn't see exactly what was happening with my trash can. And you know what? Physics really likes to show you more than anything else exactly what's happening. That's what we love more than anything else. We want to see exactly all the pieces of this. So I'm now going to put some theatrical fog in this garbage can. Now theatrical fog is just glycerin. We heat up, it becomes a fog. If put glycerin in all your food, they just don't tell you. So don't worry about this. <laughs> but what I'm going to do now was happening every single time I hit this trash can. Really, it was happening every time. You just didn't see it. And this, to me, is one of the reasons why science is so much fun. <laughs> what is that? A smoke ring, right? In fact, now, yeah, I can aim it. <laughs> and you know what's true, too? Remember that energy pulse in our slinky? This is an energy pulse, too. I can actually hit it slow, like this, or I can go fast. It's an energy pulse. Now, you want me to hit you with a smoke ring, right? I want you to go home and build one. That's what I want. I want you to be curious enough to go home and build this exact same thing. Build it out of a five gallon bucket. It's a whole lot of fun. Now, what's that shape? That's a circle. What is that shape? So if I take the square and I put it right here in the front of the garbage can, what are we going to see now? Sparkles. <laughs> Hearts. No? How about a rhombus? What are we going to see? Circles, huh? Squares. I say you place your bets and win some money from your neighbors, right? Because now we're going to see. What are we going to see? Circles. Only stable shape is the smoke ring. Smoke sprays don't exist. They're like unicorns. You want them to be real, but they really don't exist. Sometimes in life, things don't exist. Now, why is it only that smoke ring and not the smoke spray? You ever blow a soap bubble? What shape floats away from you? A sphere, a circle. That's where the forces are balanced. Smoke squares, like a bubble square, the forces aren't balanced. You're really not going to see that floating away from you, just like this guy right here. Right? That's why you got that. Now, does anybody here know what gravitation waves are? Yeah. What's gravitation waves? I don't know. <laughs> You're going to do well at Rutgers. <laughs> anybody else? Gravitation waves are actually what happens in our universe when two really large massive objects, like two black holes combine. They send a pulse through space time. And we actually now have two experiments here in the United States that see these gravitation waves. It's actually very, very successful physics. But I can actually show you what a gravitation wave looks like with this shape right here. What's that? An ellipse, right? And I take that ellipse and I put it right here on the front of my garbage can. Now I'm going to put a little more theatrical fog in here. And when I do all of this, you're actually going to see a modern physics demonstration. Because we really only actually had proof of gravitation waves only about two years ago. And this is actually just what they look like as they propagate through space. You see what's happening to the ellipse? Springing back and forth just like that as it propagates through the air. Actually bouncing back and forth just like that. 
So it's not only a smoke ring garbage can, it's a gravitational wave. There you go. <laughs> Okay, we're up to, all this stuff so far has been propagating waves that are just pulses. But now we're going to look at wiggles that are what we call a simple harmonic wave. We shake them up and down in a periodic fashion. And here are two, and here is a waves on a rope. By the way, this is a neat toy, but with a laser you have to be very careful. You always treat them as though they're dangerous. So you don't let it cross anybody's eyes ever. And uh, so this one is vibrating slowly. And this one's vibrating very quickly. And so this one you see has a repeat distance in space from one maximum to another that we call the wavelength. Here you can see it better. It's the very sm short wavelength here, long wavelength here. And this one is very high frequency, and that means it's like in a sound wave, it would be like ee! And this guy down here, I have a beautiful singing voice, you know. <laughs> and uh, like a squeaky wheel. And this one up here, is vibrating very slowly, and so as a f t its frequency is like so it's so the short wavelength has the high frequency, and the long wavelength has the low frequency. Okay, now. Now we're going to do, oh yes, the, uh, the uh, yes, start it off. Here is a simulation of a wave like this one hitting a wall, and it reflects off the wall, and it's going this way red, and it comes back in blue. And when you add the two together, uh, if you look at the two interfering waves, they're going opposite directions, but the re result of the addition of the two always has the maximums at the same place. And the zeros at the same place, and you set up what we call a standing wave. And so only when the wavelength fits into the length does this is this standing wave stable. And now we can show you an example, the one behind, if you look at the stand stable standing waves on a rope, this is of course the same sort of stuff that Pythagoras worked out for music, pleasant sounding notes for standing waves on a string. Here the first one is the lowest frequency, longest wavelength, has no motion on that end, no motion on that end, and it has a maximum in the middle. So that's the lowest frequency. So if we go to a little higher frequency, you see a zero in the middle. And you see a maximum here and a maximum there. You might lean on that. Le lean on the side that's vibrating. Thank you. Ah, there you go. We go to the next highest frequency. It's a little higher. And you see that it has a zero here, and a zero here, and three maximums. And you can keep on going to even higher frequency, and you get more and more. Yes? What? No, no, no. It's just a rope. It's a little cotton rope. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, it wouldn't even hurt. Uh, you're just like my students, you want to see bad stuff happen to me. <laughs> okay, that's what I'm here for. Uh, okay, so those are standing waves and traveling waves, and now we're going to move on to a different kind of wave. And now we're going to go to electro clear, yeah. And where's the, the lasers right are here? Right over here. Okay. Let me make sure I've got the right laser. Yes. Yep. 
All right, now, here I have a block that glows when light goes through it. You can see very nicely the track of the light. But I want you to notice that the light above it comes into the top surface. And can you point more this direction? We're not getting the, there we go. You see how it comes in like this? And you see how it bends when it goes into the material? It bends, and so light is a traveling wave of photon of, of light, and it has a certain wavelength, and when it slows down and goes into this solid, because it has to vibrate the electrons in there, and the atoms, it changes its direction. You can also do this uh, sort of an experiment, where you shine it in like this, and you can see it's reflecting off the top surface. You can see that, right? And there's also a reflection from this surface right here, and that reflection is up here. I got quit. Oh, it quit, okay. And so that comes right here, is the reflection from this top surface. That occurs even when I'm here. I go in, it bends, but then there's, see the reflection up there on the ceiling? So whenever you go from a medium like air where the light travels quick, fast, to a medium where it slows down, the light bends. It has a kink in it. And also you get a reflection from the interface. Now this particular, and as, ah, oh, there we go. This particular block of material glows very nicely in ultraviolet light. I dumpster dough for this block of material. It was being thrown away by the particle physicists. And I dove in a dumpster and peeled the lead off the outside and uh, kept it for demonstrations. And then also I have here, well that one doesn't have but a sprayer on it. <laughs> oh yes, usually the students like to see me embarrassed. Can you see that at all? Let me try another color. <laughs> okay. Maybe one last one. I was, I'm never satisfied with it. I've got to get better colors. <laughs> okay. Now we want to turn off the... Oh, okay, we're up I to this one? I got that guy, yeah. Okay. And the other guy will settle down. And I have to find my... There's my other laser. If I have this phosphorescent material glow in the dark material, and I hit it with green, not much happens. But if I use a violet laser, which has a higher energy, I can... <laughs> you can draw on it very nicely. Okay, so the electrons get kicked out of the atoms or molecules, and then they have to go to some other molecule before they can find their way down. Here's another glow-in-the-dark material that one finds extremely useful at my age. <laughs> Mark spends a lot of time in the bathroom. <laughs> it's a glow-in-the-dark toilet seat. <laughs> They're quite useful. Here you go. Okay. Now we know that uh, light travels in waves, but it's actually also true. What else travels in waves? How do you hear my voice? Sound travels in waves. That's exactly right. So I have a question for all of you here, and I want to see if you can answer this, all right? Yeah. How big is that sound? How big is that? What do you mean pretty big? As opposed to what? How big is that? Why is that a strange question? How do human beings measure sound? We know if the sound is loud or if the sound is soft. We don't really know if the sound is large or small, right? How do you measure an elephant? With your eyes. We measure sound with our ears. But here on our show, we're going to show you exactly how large that sound is. How can we do that? Well, what I have right here is this long tube. And that's where that speaker is placed. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put some propane in that very long tube. And then I'm going to go ahead and light it. Hit the lights, yeah. Just like that. So let that burn all the way across there. Come on, you. So now you have a nice line of flames in that long tube. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to put it down to a nice even set 
of flames. All right. Pretty soon we're going to sing happy birthday to Mark with all these candles, but not <laughs> quite yet. <laughs> but let me put some sound back inside this tube because when I actually put the sound now back inside the tube, you see exactly how large the sound is. That's the size of the sound. You see that wave there? That's exactly what it looks like. If you could see that sound on the air going to your ears, this is what you would see. That's a sound wave. You're now seeing and hearing sound at the same time. And isn't that fun? Right? It's kind of fun. But that's one tone. What if I change the tone? What if I go higher in pitch? What happens to the size of the wave if I go higher? It actually gets smaller. You can see that. And I can actually go lower too. And if I go lower, it's bigger. So now you can relate the sound, size of the sounds you, you normally hear. You know if it's a low sound, it's a big wave. A high sound, it's a small wave. But that's just really one wave, right? What if we put a song in this tube instead? What might we see? The dancing waves of a song. And I bet, I know you all have your favorite songs. I realize that. And guess what? I'm not going to play any one of them. <laughs> no. Instead, what I'm going to do, I'm going to play a song that I think you all know. And you say to me, Dave, how do you know a song that we all know? Right? All these different generations, all different people. But we actually do have a song that you all know. And let me see if I can find it. Let me cue it on up. There we go. You tell me if you know this song. What song is that? Star Wars. Yeah, who doesn't know Star Wars, right? <laughs> now we're going to see all the waveforms we got in that Star Wars theme song. Some are large and some are small, but you're now seeing a song dance in the flames. Hey, this is how I play my stereo at home. What's wrong with this, right? <laughs> you see a big one and a small one. One of my favorite demonstrations of all time is actually showing you exactly what a song looks like in flame. There you go. So I hope you enjoyed that one. Now, what do we see right here? What do you see in your, in your video? Two beakers, right? There's a beaker there and there's a beaker there, aren't there? So we've got two beakers sitting inside that camera, right? Uh, why do you see the beaker? Because the light is bending, right? So you notice when the light's bending, so then you say, yeah, there's something there. That's how our eyes work. But here's what I can actually do. Here's what I can actually do. I can put some magic fluid inside that middle beaker and let that pour on in just like that. Now do you still see that beaker? And you see that fluid too. But this magic fluid, which really isn't anything other than vegetable oil, has exactly the same, bends that light exactly the same way as that glass. So if I actually overfill the beaker, what's happening to the middle beaker now? It's starting to disappear, isn't it? Because no longer is the light actually bent. Once I actually surround that beaker with this fluid, do you see that middle beaker anymore? No. You can't see it anymore because the light is no longer bending. As it goes through the fluid and the beaker, it doesn't change how it goes through both. So you can no longer see that. And that's exactly why you see things, right? That light is bending. So there you go. Mark. Hey, we're now going to do a lot of the same things with some light and different sources. Please get those glasses on that we had before. Okay, does anybody need a pair of glasses? If you need a pair of glasses, let us know. Those are our gift to you, okay? And when is the last time Rutgers actually gave you something? All right? <laughs> so, first thing I'd like you to do. is go ahead and look at that light bulb right there. What happens when you now look at that light bulb, okay, through your glasses? Please move that way off the corner. What happens? Oh, okay. You see rainbows. You see rainbows on one side, rainbows on the other side. And rainbows are just like unicorns, but real, right? We like rainbows, right? So we got rainbows on both sides with those glasses, right? So that's, a, that's a high temperature. We have, we're putting a lot of current through that. 
Uh oh. That's okay. Turn right, we gotta you plug the plug it back in. Yeah. That's what they have professors for, to pull up the plugs. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So there's a very high temperature. And you see it's got the full rainbow. Now I'm going to make it be cooler and cooler. I'll turn down the electricity to it. And where does it disappear? What color disappears? The blue. The purple and blue, yeah? And violet. And finally, at very low temperatures, it's just red and green. So that means you can tell the, the temperature of something Keep just by looking at the light that comes off of it. If it's really hot, you see lots of blue, and if it's, it's really cold, it moves over into the red. Okay? And so you can look at stars, and you can see the temperature of stars that way. Now we have another type of radiation here in another source. And, uh, I got it for you. Oh, you got it? Okay. Yeah. We'll turn that off. We have that light source on. Now, what do you see through your glasses? There's, there's a bunch of extra stripes in there due to reflections, but what's the brightest line you see? Oh, uh, actually, the one, the brightest line I see is the red. Are we in agreement? Okay, that is the most famous emission line uh, from an element in the universe. That's hydrogen. We're tickling hydrogen with, a, with an electrical discharge. And so that's what hydrogen looks like when you tickle it with, with, uh, with, with either radiation or with, uh, with electricity. Now let's try the next one here. What's the brightest line there? Yellow. What's the color of the sun? Yellow. Yellow. I want you to remember this. This is helium. These are the specific lines of helium. Okay? The universe is actually made up of 20% hydrogen, 80% uh, hydrogen and 20% helium and only uh, the rest of everything else is just a, less than 1%. Now look at this one right here. Do you see lots of sort of nice colors? Blues and greens and oranges? Okay. If we turn on a fluorescent light bulb, you see the blues and greens and oranges also. That's because they have some mercury on the inside of there, some uh, probably mercury oxide, and that is the same mercury that's in this tube down here being tickled by electricity. So you can tell what element of the periodic table just by the lines it gives off. And the last one here is the sort of honky-tonk color. I can't, I, I haven't seen it yet. Ah, oh, yes, 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 that's, that's neon, okay? And that's what you see lighting up red lights above buildings and things like that. Now, Mark actually said we can actually tell what elements we have here by the colors that you see in your glasses due to those elements. They're actually specific fingerprints. But what we have right here is another type of bulb. What do you see when you look at that bulb right there? You see a rainbow, right? But what color is missing inside that rainbow? Yellow. yellow. There's a black line where the yellow should be, right? Yeah. Hey, I don't say it, bulb manufacturers say it. They say human beings don't like yellow light mixed with the rest of their light. So they actually coat the interior of this bulb with a material that absorbs that yellow. This is actually exactly what astronomers do too, because they look at any star in our universe, they know exactly what's in between that star and our star, our place right here on Earth, due to the, what kind of lines are in that light. They can tell what's absorbing the light, what's in the way. So if we get the same kind of light that's missing than hydrogen, we know we got a hydrogen cloud in front of us because it's absorbing that light and it no longer gets towards us. This is actually extremely powerful physics and you are doing it right now. Now, here's what I'm going to do. I want to show you how much fun you can have with those glasses. What do you see when you look at all those lights? Hey, take your heads, go side to side like this. It's like a bird in flight, isn't it? What those glasses do is they dissect light. You can actually tell exactly what kind of light you have by the way it goes through those glasses. And that's actually a really good thing. We don't dissect animals in physics. We dissect light, right? <laughs> and uh, 
Basically, look at all the lights in your house. Look at all the lights in New York City at night if you're headed to the city. That's a lot of fun. Look at all your holiday lights. That's actually really, really fun. Look at a full moon. A full moon is spectacular in these glasses. But just never look at the sun with those glasses or your bare eyes. That's actually really something that no one should ever do. You can go blind immediately. But let's see how much fun we can have with these glasses. What do you see there now? Yeah, you see a whole series of lights there. But what happens as these lights change color? You're seeing color mixing in action as those lights shift through their colors. You can see exactly what colors are made up inside that rainbow. So be a scientist in your own house. Why not? It can be exciting to be a scientist in your own house as well as almost anywhere else. We're scientists all the time anyway. So there you go. That's all the rainbows we got for you today. But save those glasses for their next experiment. There you go. Those glasses are what we call diffraction gratings. And they have little lines on them that separate out the colors by bouncing the light off of different stripes on them. Now, this just gives you a few examples. Uh, if you look at over here at, in the sky, maybe around January, over, sort of over there in the sky, over in the east, you will see the constellation Orion with the three belt stars. And the three belt stars point down to Sirius, the brightest star in the sky, sometimes called the dog stars, because it's in conjunction with the sun in the dog days of August, the hot days of August. And if anybody, there's a little physics joke on this, or astronomy joke, if somebody says, are you Sirius? You said, no, Sirius is the brightest star in the sky. All right, all right. So it's, uh, but these stars are hot white stars, like Rigel down here. They're 11,000 degrees Kelvin. And so their spectrum shows lots and lots of blue, OK? The, if you look in the cons Orion constellation, up here in his upper arm, he has a bright red star. This is a red giant star called Betelgeuse. And he's a third of the temperature, only about 3,000 degrees Kelvin. And that's why he looks red. These guys look white, blue, and this guy looks red. So you can see the difference between the different uh, temperature stars just by looking in the sky. Now, if you look at Orion's belt with a telescope, you will see a red glow right here in the sword of Orion. And if you put a diffraction grating in front of the telescope, you see these lines. You recognize these lines? Do you recognize this line? You saw that once before. Hydrogen. This is a hot, glowing cloud that's being lit up by newly born stars that are lighting up the hydrogen cloud out of which they were born. And so you see a glowing cloud of hydrogen there in the Orion constellation. Next one, let's see. Oh, well, this just shows you a comparison of the spectrums for the people that are uh, online uh, of the different elements that we looked at. Now, go ahead. Ah, this is, the, this is a comparison of the mercury, the lines, and the bulb, and then... Ah, this is the one. Remember I said, remember the yellow line? Well, this is a replication of a picture that was taken in 18, 1850. And they, at a solar eclipse, they looked at the spectrum of the coronasphere of the sun, and they saw that yellow line. And they'd never seen that yellow line before that. So they knew they'd discovered a new element of the periodic table. And in fact, the element they discovered was helium. So they named it after helos for the sun, the Greek for helos for the sun. They named it helium. So it's the one element of the periodic table that was discovered not on the earth, surface of the earth, but in the, in, in the atmosphere of the sun. OK, they'd never seen it before. So as Mark said, we can tell temperature by what light you're getting, right? We saw that with our small filament light. So we're actually going to show you what you look like with light, because this is all of you. Yeah, you're glowing right now in infrared. You notice? 
Yeah, you're always putting out this kind of light all the time. You just don't know it because we can't see in infrared. We're not sensitive to infrared. So we actually don't see what we look like in infrared. All right? But I can show you that right now with this camera. And this is kind of fun. And you know, you're our one hot audience. <laughs> yeah. You're all glowing like this all the time. And actually, infrared, it's not quite the same as visible light. Let's see if we can show you that. You actually know it already, but yeah, let's see if we can show you. Because Mark right here has a sign. He's going to put that sign in front of his face. Mark, look at them. Okay. Look at them. But put the sign in front of your face. <laughs> look at them. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, the, okay. Yeah, I got it. He's, he's like a trained pony. Once in a while, I've got to give him a sugar cube. Hey, can you see Mark through that sign? Visible light goes right through that sign. But let me put this camera on Mark. He's not going to face me. He's going to put that sign in front of his face. We can no longer see Mark. Infrared light does not go through plastic or plexiglass or glass. But you knew that already. You go to the beach. You park your car. You go off to the water. You come back five or six hours later. How hot is your car? Very hot. Why? Because visible light gets through the windows. We know that. We can see out the car. But once it gets into the car, it starts to heat the car up. Tries to leave as infrared light, can't get back out through the glass. Stop by the glass as you saw right here. So your car quickly gets to 200 degrees. That's what's happening. Simple physics, but you knew it already. Now Mark has a whole other object. What is it? A black plastic trash bag. And he puts it over his body. And please don't go home and put a bag on your body, OK? <laughs> Can you see Mark through that black plastic trash bag? No, but if I put this camera on Mark, we can still see him. Yeah. Infrared light goes right through the black plastic. Visible light does not. We just want you to know that it works a little bit different than that other light. So there you go. Now we're going to leave light right now. We're going to do a whole other part of physics. We're actually going to talk about sinking and floating. And for that, I'm going to use this water bath right here. Anybody here ever take a water bath? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a good idea, right? I could probably use one right now. That's water that we have right here. What is this right here? What kind of soda? Pepsi. Pepsi. Diet Pepsi. You ever pick one of these cans up? I'm not saying you drink this stuff. I'm just saying, did you ever lift up a can? OK, good. What's this one right here? Regular Pepsi. You ever pick one of these up? Yeah, no, no, I'm not saying you drink it. So we know this, we know this, and we know water. So you can easily tell me. I'm going to take this can of soda. I'm just going to pop it right into the water like that. I'm not going to open it. Does this can of soda sink or float in the water? Wait a second. I thought you knew this. What's it going to do? What do we do to find out? Test it. I'm going to do the experiment. I'm going to put it right here in the water, and it? Sinks. There you go. Diet Pepsi, sink or float? Float, why? Because it's diet, what kind of theory is that? What's it going to do? I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what. You go home and do it. Oh, you want me to do it? You're that curious now. You actually want to know the answer, and that's exactly what a scientist is. A scientist is just a curious human being. You are all scientists pretty much all the time. So I'm going to put this in here. What's it going to do? Whoa. Now science isn't just about the experiment. Science is now about why. Why? What are they putting that soda at the bottom of the water bath to make it sweet? Sugar. Sugar. And if you took that sugar out of that can of soda, there's a good almost two inches of thick, heavy sugar inside that can of soda. That's what you're drinking. Yum, yum, yum. What are they putting in this to make it sweet? Rat poison. I mean, our, yeah, aspartame. <laughs> they were looking for a rat poison when they came up with actually aspartame in real life. That's a true story. What does that make us? The rats. That's right. And they only need a little bit of material to make it as sweet as all that sugar. So that's less dense than water. That's more dense than water. But guess what? Hey, has anyone here ever been in a swimming pool? Me too. Has anyone out here ever been in our lovely ocean? Me too. Where do you feel more of a buoyant force kind of lifting you up? Ocean. Ocean, why? What's in the ocean? Salt. salt and sharks and toilet paper, lots of stuff. So if I take salt and I add it to the water bath, I can actually bring that other soda right to the surface. Because sinking and floating is all about relative density, as you can see right there. Now what floats in our air? What floats 
in the air. Air. <laughs> air. Balloons. You got a birthday, they give you a balloon. And what gas is in the balloon you get? Helium. Helium. You ever make funny voices? Yeah, yeah we Thank all you. like helium, right? And we got a helium balloon right here, that blue helium balloon. And Mark is about to pop it. Okay, so if you're scared of popping balloons, please go ahead and cover your ears. Now here we have a balloon with a whole other kind of gas. It floats a lot better than helium. We're never, ever, ever going to run out of this gas here on Earth. Why don't they give you hydrogen balloons? <laughs> oh, it's more than flammable. <laughs> if you're scared of loud noises, please cover your ears. But leave your eyes open. You're definitely going to want to see this. And so we'll do a little chemistry. We got the lights. What's Mark creating when he does this? Water. Water. Three, two, one. <laughs> Thank you. What was that balloon floating in? Air. What's outside this drum? Air. What's inside the drum? And the air inside the drum is pushing like this. And the air outside the drum is pushing like this. So there's a stability there, as much force inside as outside. But what if I take all the air out of this drum? What might happen? I say we find out. I say we find out. And uh, guess what? We never know how violent this is going to be, or how loud this is going to be, or how destructive this is going to be. So we're just going to let it sit there and spin. OK? You can talk about this. OK. Uh, this is this is really important. Pay no attention to that. Okay? That's not it. <laughs> now, if you've got one thing you remember from this lecture, I want you to realize what temperature is and pressure is. It's That's not it. That's not it either. Uh, here I have I, two gases. What's the difference between these gas atoms? Here they're going fast. Here they're going. Slow. This one has lots of energy of motion of the atoms. This one has very little energy of motion on the average. So this one has a high temperature. You can see the high temperature here. This one has a low temperature. That's all the temperature is. The average energy per atom. It just adds up on the average, lots of them. So it's not just some arbitrary scale. And zero degrees Kelvin is where they all stop moving. So this is high temperature. If this one hits the wall, it bounces off very gently. If these guys hit the wall, they push on the wall very hard. So there is a high pressure here because things big are hitting the wall fast. And there's a very low pressure, same size objects, but they just sort of gently push on the walls. So this is high temperature and low <laughs> temperature as looked at from a microscopic scale. And that's the way I want you to think about this. Now inside of my friend here, there is atoms of air or molecules of air hitting it from the outside very much like this. But there's nothing on the inside. So that means the pressure on the outside is big and nothing is pushing out from the inside out and eventually it's going to implode upon itself. And uh, it, it's coming along. We have to wait a little bit for that. Oh yes, maybe turn on, if, if you turn gravity on here, look what happens. We're, there's lots of molecules or atoms down here and very few up here and the ones that are down here are moving fast and the ones that are up here are moving slow. But you knew that, right? It's cold at the top. 
<laughs> that was it. <laughs> I have to go change my underwear. I'll be right back. <laughs> So what happened to our drum? When we took out all those particles that were pushing from the inside, it could no longer stand all the pressure from the outside. So what happens? It crushes, right? Now, I could actually take the hose out, and you can hear the air go back inside. But just like that beer can I crushed on my head last night, you're not going to see this re-expand, right? Because there's just too much deformation to a great big steel drum, which is what we have right here. So there you go. Our drum. And now Mark's going to do a little bit more okay. about temperature. As I was saying, it's cold at the top of mountains because the atoms are moving around slowly. It's hot down in deep valleys where the uh, atoms are moving very quickly. Now this is one of my favorite demonstrations. This is liquid nitrogen. By the way, I've been working with liquid nitrogen for about 50 years now. I'm going to keep my distance from it, but you guys should not fool around with liquid nitrogen. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's really very, very cold. Now, this is a helium balloon, and if I was to let go of it, its buoyancy would make it float up to the ceiling because their density is too small. It's, it's less than the that of air. But if I start cooling it down, what happens to the atoms on the inside? <laughs> slow down. Yes, they slow down. And so if they slow down, the, temp the temperature's dropping, so the atoms slow down, and that means they hit the walls with less push, I can do it. and the pressure on the plastic decreases and you see the balloon starts to shrink okay and they're getting slower and slower and slower and the balloon is shrinking more and more and more but its total weight stays the same so its density goes up and eventually it gets more dense than air and it doesn't float anymore and it sinks but now they start warming up again, and they float back up, okay? So this is exactly, bye-bye. <laughs> It'll be there for a while. Okay, now I have some other stuff that I, we traditionally do with liquid nitrogen. And uh, tongs, no, I guess I can use the glove. Here's oh, one here. thing. Yeah. yeah, bring the copper ramp over. That's good. Yeah. Good idea. And here's another thing. What's this right here? A hot dog. That's right. The other le lectures thought it was a carrot. And this is to illustrate that they get very brittle, very hard and very brittle when you cool them off anything. This is what had happened to your finger if you stuck it in. It becomes very brittle. Now, here is another common everyday. That's broccoli, that's right. And I used to very, very much enjoy crushing broccoli. But then, of course, my wife started using garlic on it. Or I actually, she'd been using it all along. And I got my courage up and I tasted it, and it was delicious. A little garlic makes the broccoli delicious. It's delicious anyway. Now this banana here, that's a banana. What's that? A banana split, that's right. Okay, and I keep this box around me so that no cold things come flying off. You don't pick up anything that was uh, cold here because it's the same reason you don't put your nose on a mailbox in northern Minnesota in the middle of the winter. Because when you move away from the mailbox, your nose stays on the mailbox, okay? These can burn you or, or peel off the outer layers of your skin. So here I have some nice delicate flowers. And of course I cool them off and they become extremely brittle. And so if I then hit them, they should shatter like glass. It's not that I don't like flowers. Okay, all right. You got something behind there for you. Oh, yes, I forgot about this guy. Oh, I have to go around behind. Yeah. 
hey, who spilled all this the champagne? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you. <laughs> okay. Liquid nitrogen, when it turns into a gas, has about a thousand times its volume. So it expands greatly. So I'm going to put some liquid nitrogen in this tube, and then I'm going to put a stopper in the top so it can't escape. And so the pressure builds up and up and up, and what do I have? Whoa! Sorry about that. You okay? <laughs> <laughs> nice, catch. Oh, nice catch! Nice catch! <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is our liquid nitrogen cannon. And the liquid nitrogen cannon always reminds me of my father. Because he worked at a nitroglycerin factory. And when they hired him at the nitroglycerin factory, they took him in... They took him into his lab, and he noticed that the lab had three strong brick walls and a very, very weak uh, wooden wall. And he says, what's the story with a wooden wall? They said, well, that's a blowout wall. If you make a mistake, then the explosion occurs, and we build, sweep up all the glass and build another wall, and we hire another guy. <laughs> <laughs> and we keep doing our bill, making of nitroglycerin. Uh, but of course, given the fact that you actually go to work in a nitroglycerin factory, you want to make sure that you're working in an area that has a blowout wall, for it's better for you too, because the energy surge and the pressure surge of the explosion gets dissipated by going out the wall. Big R. Ah, uh, yes. Ah, uh, yes. Okay. Now, uh, and then we'll flip, we'll flip to that one you got. All right, now I'm going to show you some interactions of charged particles with magnetic field, and we'll talk briefly about why you should care. Uh, this is a magnet with, which has magnetic field lines coming out of one end and going in the other end. And so if I shoot charged particles, electrons in this case, right down the magnetic field lines, they don't feel any force. But if I shoot them across the magnetic field lines, I have to use the right hand rule, V, B, F, they get deflected to the side. Okay? So across, deflected, along, not deflected. So I put this guy right here. And you see that the spot stays there as long as I bring the magnetic field line straight down. This is an electron gun right here, shooting a stream of electrons at, that hit the front and then they glow because they have so much energy that changes into light. But now I'm going to lower the magnetic field so that the beam goes across the magnetic field lines and what, look what happens to the spot it gets deflected to the side. And if I reverse the direction of the magnetic field, it gets deflected to the other side. Okay? And why should you care about this? Uh, basically because the Earth has its own magnetic field and the, the magnetic field lines go like this, and so the charged particles that come in from the sun hit the magnetic field lines and get deflected to the side. So we're hit with many fewer energetic charged particles that could give you cancer from the sun because of, we've got a magnetic field umbrella. But they also get trapped in the magnetic field lines and they can run straight down at the poles and that gives us the northern and southern lights. The Aurora Borealis and the Aurora Australis. Looks good. Okay, so that's why you should care. Now we are up to here. Now these, this, well, I guess that's do how I have to do it. you want to do Faraday first? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. There we go. A little focus, yeah. And let me get, I don't have to get behind because it's up there. Here I have a coil. This is, these are called the Faraday Lectures because when Dave and I started doing them, we didn't want to call them the Dave and Mark show 
we wanted to give it a little gravitas, and so we named him after the Michael Faraday's Christmas lectures that he did every Christmas for children. So the Christmas children's lectures of Michael Faraday we named him after. And here I have a coil, and uh, this is a galvanometer that basically shows you when electricity flows in the circle one way or the other way. So if I put the magnet in here, I get the Faraday effect. I put it in, it deflects one way, I pull it out, changing magnetic field makes it deflect the other way. If I put it in there and I don't move it at all, nothing happens. It's only when you change the magnetic field in the coil that the current flows it around in the circuit. And that's the Faraday effect. And of course, if you put this flipping on a paddle wheel, it can generate alternating current electricity, and that's, of course, what we do at power stations. Now, yeah, is this guy for this you? Is, uh, these are a similar sort of changing magnetic fields, making currents flow. This is a piece of copper. This is a neodymium iron bond magnet, which is a magnet all children should stay far, far away from, and maybe most adults, too. <laughs> uh, very powerful but common these days in applications. And if I let go of it up here at the top, I want you to know, how should I be, oh, I'll start it from the back. Can I get around in front and catch it in time, do you think? Well, let's see. Okay. As it rolls down, there's a changing magnetic field at every point in the copper, so electricity starts to flow and the energy of motion changes into electrical current. And even more important, even though you're kinds of clumsy like I am, I can't roll it off. It steers and that's like a canoe because the changing magnetic field on the outside doesn't have any electrons to set in motion. The one on the inside does and so it's like paddling on one side of a canoe or the other. And let me put this back on here so it's safely stored. Now Mark had a really powerful magnet as you saw over there. This is actually twice the size, actually even more powerful. These are very strong magnets, as he warned you, and you want to be very careful with them. But here's a nice big copper tube right here. And this actually used to be a wire. Think about how, how much current used to go through here. They actually put coolant through the middle of it, where is why we have a hole there. That's what it was made for. But we use it for a whole different reason. And as you saw with that copper ramp, that magnet wasn't attracted to the copper ramp, but there's an interplay between the copper and the magnetic field. So I can actually take this big magnet and take that copper tube. You can see down the copper tube, let me drop the magnet down the copper tube. Because what happens? it really slows down, right? Isn't it kind of like an astronaut falling through space? Yeah. It comes way down there. The interplay of this strong magnetic field with that thick copper actually opposes the motion, right? That's what we have going on here. As long as that magnetic flux moves through the copper tube, it creates this corresponding magnetic field inside the tube, pushing back on the movement, as you can see right there. And that's a lot of fun, right? Now Mark has a whole other object over here that he's going to start playing with. And it basically is a reverse of what we have here. Here the magnet is in place. He's going to move the metal instead. OK, so here's some aluminum. It's not magnetic. But if I roll it through a magnet, it sees a changing magnetic field. And basically, it sees a magnet running past it. And that sets electrical currents up. And so the motion of the object changes into electrical energy when it hits the magnet. So it's linear motion is transformed into electrical energy uh, in flowing inside of the, inside of the met metallic aluminum piece. Now here is one that's been milled out on the inside. Uh, you think it will have the same effect? No. no. Well, let's see. Let me remind you, it still has a path for current to flow in a circle. And so we end up seeing we still get pretty much the same effect. This one right here has been fiendishly cut from both sides, this side, this side, so that no electrical current can flow in a circle. And so when it goes through, it's as if the magnet isn't there at all. 
Okay, the electrical current can't flow in the circle. There's no eddy currents. Now, I cool it to liquid nitrogen temperature and stay away from these cooled objects. Again, remember the not putting your nose on the mailbox in Minnesota. Uh, here, the current flows much more easily, and the effect is <laughs> really big. It got stuck. It was so slow, it actually got stuck against the edge. And there's a cute thing you notice that it actually speeds up. There, it's got increasing magnetic field, constant magnetic field, it takes a little jump. And then whenever you have a changing magnetic field, you have it uh, currents induced. Now, this is another version of the same thing, except now what I do is I turn on electrical current, and I have an electromagnet. I turn it off and this piece of iron falls off. So electricity flows in a circle and it gives a magnetic field and it's alternating current. So the electricity goes from field up to field down 60 times a second, changing magnetic field. And so here I have a circle. I put it on here and I turn this guy on so there'll be a changing magnetic field here that makes current flow in here. This turns this into an electromagnet and the two repel each other. It's a little more subtle than that, but that's all right. And so they, uh, we have a ring flinger. Okay? Actually, I used to have kids come up. I'd say, okay, uh, put this on here like this, and then I'd turn it on, and they'd go. <laughs> now I'd turn it off and take them, no, put it on like this, okay? <laughs> they suggested I stop doing that. <laughs> and now this one right here, has a slice cut in it so electricity can't flow in a circle. So when I turn it on, nothing happens. But of course, the children didn't trust me at all. And I had to show them that the solid one still jumps and the other one does not. Now the final thing, or there's two final things. First one is this. If I cool this to low temperature, I get the effect on steroids. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Let's leave it there. <laughs> I need my I need my fingerprints. Uh, okay, and now this is the exact same thing almost as this, except I put a light bulb across the hole. So now electricity will be able to flow in a circle, but it has to go through the light bulb first. And so I turn this guy on, and no connections, just a transformer effect. And so the changing magnetic field delivers energy to the light bulb and induces currents. Okay. Now we need two volunteers for our very last group of demonstrations. Yeah, you, you come on down. Yes, you, sir, over there. Yeah, you, yeah. Come on down. What's your name, young lady? Aaron, so good to meet you. My name's Dave. What's your name, sir? Alex. Alex, so good to meet you. My name's Dave. I'm so glad you two volunteered. Uh, do you know what you volunteered for? The bed of nails. <laughs> Did you change your mind? Because you never volunteer in a physics show. It's a really bad idea, right? Look at me. I volunteered years volunteer ago. I volunteered all the time. But don't you two worry. You're not getting anywhere near the nails. That's actually Mark's job right here. Just step on back and step right over here. And just listen to me when I pull you on over here, OK? Here's our experiment. We have right here a bed of nails. And Mark right here is going to lie his body across that bed of nails. We have a second bed of nails. Once Mark lies down, we're going to take that other bed of nails and put it nails down on Mark's body. <coughs> then our two new friends here are going to stand on Mark. <laughs> yeah. He gets down slower every year. So come on over here, Alex. Come on over here. Yes. No, it's okay. No Not problem. Yet. We'll put this other one first. There you go. <laughs> Right down here, not too right. close to his chin, right there, right there. <laughs> oh, he's doing fine. Like all right. Off. Now, here's no, what you'll be all right. I'm going to put you right there. Hold his hand. Uh, no and, dancing. Aaron, do you mind if I just kind of pick you up and put you right there? <laughs> and now okay. we have two okay. human beings on Mark while they lose between two beds and nails. <laughs> and Mark is perfectly. No jumping. Absolutely. <laughs> wonderfully. <laughs> 
Not very good. We'll take you up. There you go. Just like that. All right. A big round of applause for our two volunteers. Thank you both so much. There you go. Good bow. Now, we don't do this kind of thing because it looks like magic. We don't want you to think this is magic. This is actually really good physics. Mark, you stay right there. Okay. All right? I've got something that's very, very, very similar to Mark. Thin skin filled with hot air. Ah! And what I got right here is a whole lot of nails. Now think about it this way. Mark weighs about 200 pounds. Let's say Mark takes his body and lays his body across a bed of nails with only one nail. How many pounds of force on that one nail? 200, more than enough to drive that nail right through his body and kill him. Let's say we have 10 nails on our bed of nails. How many pounds of force on each nail? 20. More than enough to go right through his body and kill him. Yeah. Let's say we have a hundred nails on our bed of nails. How many pounds of force on each nail? Two. two. And two pounds of force on a nail actually kind of hurts. I know this personally. <laughs> hey, I do these things too many times. At the same time, you need about 12 pounds of force on a nail to go through human skin. I know that too. It was a bad day, but I had to do the experiment. What can I tell you? <laughs> so here I got a whole lot of nails. Well, that, all those nails now bust our balloon version of Mark. <laughs> what do we do to find out? Try it. And I press, and it doesn't go through the skin of a balloon. There's so many nails, there's not enough force per nail to go through the skin of the balloon. Here we have another bed of nails with half as many nails, doubling the force. Will it go through this time? Who said maybe? You can't put maybe on tests. <laughs> what do we do to find out? Try it. And I'm pressing, but it still doesn't go through the skin of a balloon. Here we have a bed of nails with half as many again. Doubling the force one more time. Will it go through this time? <laughs> this is also our last one. Will it go through this time? Yeah, that's how we do multiple choice tests too, right? Not A, it's not B. Hey, nailed it. There you go. So. Yeah, so if you like what you see here, come and see us in Manhattan. We've been there for almost 500 shows now, but this right here is a sign, right? And it looks just like a guillotine. We're gonna put it right here on Mark's neck. <laughs> now, what we have right here is a cinder block. And we're gonna, do, oh no, no, you get down there. You're not done yet. Up there like that. And we're gonna put it right here on Mark's rock hard abs. <laughs> yeah, he's been working out. And right here we have the last piece of our demonstration. Yeah. <laughs> and Mark was actually one of my professors back in 1980. And he gave me a lousy grade. We can talk about yeah. that. <laughs> it's payback time. Here's our experiment. Bed and nails, Mark, brick, sledgehammer. Does Mark live? <laughs> what do we do to find out? Do the experiment, all right? Three, two, one. You can bust the brick. <laughs> and Mark is actually perfectly fine. Oh, right great. Yeah. <laughs> he just gets up slower every year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>